Hi, this is Michael Ian Black, very famous American comedian, actor, author, really beloved on both sides of the Atlantic. But if I had to pick which continent loves me more, it's got to be North America. Oh, they go nuts for me in North America. Uh, everywhere from... They don't, they, don't, they don't go that nuts for me really anywhere. But uh, I'll tell you who people do go nuts for, Richard Herring. And uh, this is RHSLTP, which is Richard Herring's thing. I don't, know what it, I don't know what the rest of it stands for. I was on it, maybe, but I don't know what it stands for. With guest John Kearns. And what can I say about Richard Herring and all the great work that he does playing snooker and sometimes appearing on television on shows that never make it to the States um, and building brick walls or stone walls on his property for no apparent reason and, and creating puppets out of household everyday objects that really don't seem to have much of a character or purpose. But I'll tell you what he has done. He has written the best book ever written about the crisis in masculinity, the problem with men, written by himself, Richard Herring, out on November 5th. And you may say, Michaeline Black, but you've written an incredible book uh, about the crisis in masculinity, and that's true. And you may say, but Michael, your book is, your book is better than The Problem with Men, and that's true. So how can you say Richard's is the best book ever written about the crisis in masculinity? And the answer is simple. He's paying me to do it. So I'm, I'm happy to say anything for money. And Richard Herring, I would say, even if I wasn't being paid, that The Problem with Men is the best book ever written about the crisis in masculinity. It's out November 5th. Would I have really said it if I wasn't being paid? No. Thanks to Michael Ian Black there, who will do anything for $80. Uh, so do check him out on Cameo. He's a very nice man. We will only torment him for a little bit longer. Um, just a little bonus extra that uh, you want to watch the next week's Rahalastapa episode 300 now, then you can. It's a very special one. We filmed it at the Bill Murray. I was the guest and John Robbins was the interviewer. Um, we did a podcast and then we did 30 bonus minutes extra of emergency questions sent in by listeners. It was a lot of fun. It was lovely to do one live again. Uh, what we're doing, you can view it right now. For £8, plus all the extra stuff, uh, and all that money will go to Refuge. Uh, all you have to do is go to rahalastpa.co.uk slash 300. That's R-H-L-S-T-P slash R-H-L-S-T-P.co.uk slash the number 300 300. And uh, pay £8, and that money, all the profit of it, so I think PayPal take a little bit of it, will go to Refuge. Also, one person who does that download will get an amazing package of Rahalastapa, Rahalastapa merchandise, including a Rahalastapa Rubik's Cube that are rarer than hen's teeth and more valuable than that as well and also more fun to play with. So if you want to watch that now, rahalastapa.co.uk slash 300. Hey, look, if you don't want to pay anything or you can't afford to pay anything, it'll be up for free next week. Not the extra half hour, though. If you wait till next week, you can get the extra half hour for five pounds. Might as well get it all now for £8 and give more money to Refuge. Thanks very much. Now let's sit back, relax and enjoy a very enjoyable Rahalasta pa 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 with John Cairns. Uh, hello! Oh, look at that's professional. That's professionalism. We've had to... We've just... Everything's been going wrong just before the show. I've got everything set up really nicely, and then that disaster happens. Welcome to the show. This is uh, 
Richard Herring's looked over for Sovereign Title Podcast. Uh, all that stone clearing snooker during lockdown to keep spirits up. Not a fucking nod from the fucking queen. Stick your MBEs up your ass, Queen Elizabeth II. That's what I say to you. I wouldn't take an MBE unless you offered me one. And you haven't done I've, all that I've done for this country. Um, but I was talking to Marcus Rashford, MBE, Joe Wicks, MBE, Mr. Motivator, MBE. Mr. Fucking Motivator's got an MBE for keeping spirits going during lockdown. And I haven't. Uh, uh, they all call it Rahalastapa Mubba'et, but they, they put the Mubba'et on there as a sarcastic joke because they all have MBEs and I don't have an MBE, despite all my fantastic work for the country. <laughs> Why did I tell my wife I didn't want an MBA, MBE? Why did I do that? I want an MBE. I just want an MBE. That's all I want. Uh, we're on Mars. If you're watching the video, if you're listening to the audio, we're on Mars. This is, it's quite nice here. Uh, not much atmosphere. I did a joke. I did a proper joke. I just thought of that just in the second. I just thought of that. Uh, I've drunk half a bottle of wine because I have no respect for this week's guest. Um, and so, oh, look, very exciting. He's very honoured. We've uh, the old notebook. Uh, where have I put that? Here it is. The Strange Thing Notebook, what I've forgotten, has a little special sleeve to make it look like a... I mean, that is available to buy on eBay if you're quick. There's less than 24 hours left. Uh, all the profits from this, all the money from this, everything from this is going to Refuge. Uh, if you want to buy this on eBay, it's got uh, uh, it's got Grayson Perry's doodle, an autograph with Alan Measles. It's got autographs of the, some of the live guests, maybe including today's guest. And I don't think so. I think, we, I think it started just after he was... Uh, on last time, I might be wrong. Uh, and um, it's currently at £985 on eBay with a day to go. It'd be very exciting if we get more money than that uh, for Refuge. But look, we've got a new specially made notebook. It says Rahalastapa Show Notes. It's got a picture of me on it. It's got pictures of the guests on the back. It's made by Papier, who have not paid me to advertise them. It costs like £20 or something to make it. But if you're selling them for a grand, you know, keep the money next time, can I? Got to think. Um, so our guest is very honoured to be the first. This is the 299th episode. So close to being the 300th episode that we've done about 400, really. Uh, and what else have I got for you? Um, uh, <laughs> oh, I meant to put this picture. Look, I'm a, I am drunk. I meant to put that picture up of them when I was talking about them. What, what's next? Oh, yes. So... Uh, their government in trouble for this advert. Fatima's next job could be in cyber. Apparently, it's from a few years ago in any case. Um, but I would like to congratulate Dom Cummings uh, for instituting my plan that all dancers and actors should become sex robots. That's basically what he's saying there. And uh, I think uh, Dom Cummings should be the name of the tray you have to pull out to clean from the sex robot. Although they're actually, they'd have to be human beings pretending to be sex robots, which I'm, I'm cool with. Um, uh, I should remind you, of course, that my book, uh, The Problem With Men, there's the whole front cover if you're watching the video, uh, is coming out on November the 5th, well in time for November the 19th, which is actually when International Men's Day is. Damn, I've ruined the surprise. Um, please do pre-order that as a book, an ebook, or a, or a uh, audio book. The audio book is very good value. I think you'll enjoy it. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's available for pre-order. I will be pushing it uh, next week, episode 300. I will be um, interviewed by John Robbins, who has read the book and believes it to be excellent. I, I, I'm glad that he thinks that. Uh, we'll be talking about the book and much more besides, I'm sure. Um, and that will be available to download ahead of time if you're prepared to pay some money. And that money will also go to refuge. What Am I just the nicest guy in the world? I live on Mars. I don't need money. I live on Mars. Uh, and I just a little, uh, want a little addendum to last week's uh, cupboard, uh, carousel cupboard being stuck. Uh, I know last week I revealed that it was opened. And a lot of people got in touch with me to say, what are you doing keeping your pans in there, Richard? That's stupid. You should keep uh, tins and stuff that can't jam up the door uh, so i put my tins in there some tins look at that quite a lot of i've got quite a lot of uh, sweet corn there's some apricots i think there quite a lot of beans and the tins fall off and go into the mechanism and jammed it as well so fuck you people who uh said that 
you're all idiots. I'm wearing my Hellestapa jumper, which I haven't worn for a while, which is on the front page of the front cover of this notebook, which will one day sell for a thousand pounds. And I think next week I'm going to sell this jumper on eBay and raise money for charity as well, because I'm just a I'm, a, I'm just a brilliant guy. Um, it cost me five hundred pounds this jumper. That was my own money. I didn't even put it through any businesses. I just bought it with my own money. <laughs> I could have offset that against tax, and I didn't. So I'm going to donate that. So it's got to get more than £500. It's got to be worth it. It's a beautiful jumper. Look at that. So do look out for that on eBay. Um, what a chump paying 500 quid for a jumper. Who the fuck do you think you are? Oh, no, I was a bit late up here. That wasn't the reason we were late starting, because we've got just a problem with this uh, system, but we hopefully we'll sort it out. Uh, my, I had to go in. My daughter was awake. And she'd like, was it Joey and friends? She'd put on all her pajamas and some other shirts and trousers as well. I was wearing about 10 sets of clothing. She was meant to be asleep. So I had to take all her, all but one of her pajamas off before I could come up and do the podcast. Uh, she's crazy. I don't know where she gets it from. I do not know where she gets it from. Right. Look, um, my guest this week. Probably best known for his appearance in Stand Up Hero 2010, episode series one, episode one, he was on. Let's find out more about that. Will you please welcome, he's one of my favourite guests we've ever had on. He's, he's got everything to live up to, and now without the white hot glare of the audience to help him along. <laughs> it's John Gans, ladies and gentlemen. Where is he? There he is, look. He's like a medieval painting. Look at him. Well, my... You're all like black in the background with just your face, like you've been painted by like a... Titian. I'm going to say, I'm just was just a guess. How are you doing, John? I'm all right. I'm good, Rich. I, I went. Um, I specifically uh, went to an art gallery to see a Titian. Did you? Yeah, I got a. Um... How was it? Well, so I like um, I like Lucian Freud. Yeah. So I did good. a. Uh, I did. I got given a voucher at City Lit, so I did a day course at City Lit about Lucian Freud, and um, the uh, um, the the teacher. I was the only English guy there. Weirdly, everyone else was like Polish and Spanish. Weird, but um, she said Titian was his favourite artist, and the best example of that was in Edinburgh at the National Gallery, and um, he said it had the best tummy. In this painting, it had the best tummy in the art world. Okay. And he also said, the more you look at Titians, the more dogs you see. Anyway, so I went to uh, Edinburgh Art Gallery because I was on tour there yeah. last year. And um, I went and looked at this painting. So... Um, Is there more to it than that? Was it good? <laughs> well... It's one of those... I don't know. It's one of those things where I was looking at it. And it's quite. It's quite... <laughs> <laughs> to go to an art gallery to specifically see a painting. Yeah, it's a and lot it, of pressure on the painting. And every, yeah, the painting, everyone's naked as well. All the women are naked. Yeah. And it's a guy who's nice. stumbling across uh, naked women. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, as, you know, as a painting, I wish maybe that wasn't the one I was specifically looking for. <laughs> but, yeah, it's true. But also the painting has, like, she's pregnant. So um, yeah. her paintings all looks like jelly, and Freud uh, Freud loved that. So uh, I loved it too, and that's why I, uh, that's why I look like a Titian. Okay, that might be well. That is, I'm glad you've put all that effort in, and I'm glad that I recognise the reference so expertly there, right at the start without it's prompting. Also I was cholesterol like... and uh, lighting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell us about. Um... Stand up here, but your appearance in Stand Up Hero. I don't know if we've talked about it before. It's your first IMDb. Is it? Uh, yeah, it's the first thing on IMDb. I've gone back quite deep. I found quite some. I found some quite historic bits of John Cairns, but I didn't find a clip of Stand Up Hero. Is this you trying to be a Stand Up Hero, or you? What year was it? Is this you? Twenty ten. It says on IMDb. I believe. I think it's like a stand up competition. <sighs> no. No, I don't no know, memory. Man. I don't know. Stand, stand up hero. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, I mean, was it FHM stand up hero? Maybe. Maybe, yeah. may, maybe I uh, did I audition for that. Was there yeah. a clip? I don't, I don't. I was working. Um, 
I had a day job at the time. I'm not. I don't. I don't know. Is that me? I don't. I don't remember that being me. Well, it's it's in your IMDb. I also found. I found a clip of you from 2008 in the Chortle student <laughs> comedy. Uh, oh, hmm. I hadn't seen that before. There's one from 2007 as well. Uh, tantalizingly, I mean, you look ridiculous in the picture. I you fucking like hate those terrible. fucking videos. But um, huh? what did you say? Tantalizingly, it comes up. It comes up, and you can scroll through and see it all. But when you try to play it, it just says this problem with the play. We can't watch it, so I can't see your material. Really. But I have yeah, I've seen your 2008 material, though. Do you remember what you did in 2008? Well, I mean, <laughs> sorry, what, are you going to... Are you going to... Have I just logged in to a, a, a Zoom chat where you're going to go through material I did when I was 18? I'm glad that other one you can't hear. I look, I'm wearing a You look so different. Than I know, I'm not man. even sure that one is you. <laughs> you. You at least start... In the 2008 one, you look a bit like you. Yeah, I know. Uh, but in the 2007, you don't look like you've, you. I don't know, between 2007 and 2008, you went on some kind of health kick, visits to the gym and stuff. I mean, you don't look good in 2008, <laughs> but 2007, <laughs> it looks like you might not make two. Th- I, I was wondering <laughs> if, you know, like Paul McCartney, the original John Cairns, died in 2007 and you took over in 2008, just uh, took over the franchise. I, uh, no, I remember, I, I'm wearing a... Uh... Fuck me. The thing is, you I'm sure you have it, but you look back and you know, I'm 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 with a girlfriend then. I'm but I know what I'm wearing. I I th- that clip haunts you because when you're 18, it's a chortle thing and Steve Bennett, he just shoves a bit of paper on your nose, goes sign that. You're like, "Well, yeah, I don't give a shit." Cut to 10 years later, you're like, "Well, how do I get this taken down?" Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I mean, it is I'm not people looking can can go and look at it if they want. That's the well. I don't. I don't have much up there, so that still is probably the longest <laughs> clip of me doing stand up. It's me wearing like a pink. I'm wearing a. I'm wearing like a pink and white striped shirt. I'm wearing a baby blue jumper. Wow. I'm clean shaven. Uh, haircut is too short, uh, and I'm doing material. I remember to know. Uh, <laughs> it does, <laughs> no doesn't response. get much of res- doesn't get much of response. Um, I think, but it's interesting because you're young enough that your early stuff exists on the internet. So, like, that's that's what I, you know, I was lucky enough that, I mean, some of the radio stuff I guess I did from the early 90s is still findable if you really want to find it. But if I'd had the internet when I was at university, I would have 100% put all my sketches up online and they were all terrible. Well, yeah. I mean, do you know, like, when... You know, like Palin or something, he goes, I've donated all my notebooks to uh, this university and they've got every scrap of paper I've ever written on. Yeah. If ever, if anyone ever went to me, can you give us your notebooks, please? <laughs> I'm, I'm going, yeah, yeah, sure, wait there. I'm shutting the front door and I'm burning the house down. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way in hell anyone's looking in my notebooks. <laughs> the stuff I've, uh, the stuff you know, I, you look back at them, you know, when you're looking through old stuff, going maybe there's something in here, I uh, maybe there's something I should have uh, stuck with, and you stumble across a page, you're like, fuck me, what was going on then? I've gone mad. <laughs> but you know, I don't, I never, t- I don't know about you, but I don't write material on a laptop. I just write. Yeah, I do. Uh, I do. Well, I don't write stand up. I don't write my stand up down there. They say, um, they say, I don't know. Uh, there's a, there's a chain of thought that your writing style dictates your so like uh dickens he wrote uh with like ink and uh like uh parchment and like a feather or something yeah probably so like they say he wrote long paragraph long sentences because of the time it took for him to get to the ink and then to him to go back to the paper right and then Steinbeck, is it? He wrote on um, a laptop, uh, not a laptop, a, a typewriter. So his staccato style may have been influenced by how he wrote. Yeah. Right, you're doing what you did last time where I'm giving you a fact <laughs> and you just leave it. Most normal people go, oh, that's interesting. Or oh, like, mate, you, you, left, just, you, you just left sit an there. Up in flex. 
You've left an up inflection. No, someone no, no. on YouTube today. To- no, someone on YouTube today said I talk over the guests too much. He said maybe that's because you know you're online. It's difficult to work out when they're talking. Yes, it fucking is, you stupid prick. Uh, but so I've decided to sarcastically leave bit long pauses just to show that guy what a cunt he is. Well, what, so what, what, you're going to be the victim of it. I'm not going to talk over you. Don't talk because I'm not going to talk. Over. Don't start talking now, John Ken. <laughs> I'm talking now. Don't talk over me. I'm going to leave l- sarcastically long gaps to show him how wrong he is. But also, you made it sound like you were about to come on. So Dickens did this. Steinbeck did this. It's the rule of three. And well, the- then I thought you were going to say, and what I do. Is oh well, what I do is uh, I write on um, post-it notes. Okay. I tr- I think if I can get an I- idea on a tiny square, then it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> also, I don't believe that bollocks about you reading a YouTube comment and someone said why you're talking. It's over true. It. Well, what you, I'm you, talking over you? Look, I'm talking over you. You'll be furious. But you did it. You did it, Winchester. You were just staring at me. <laughs> You don't want to talk over the laughter as people go, who the fuck's this guy? He's been dragged all the way down here. It's pissing with rain. And, uh, fuck me. Look, I I feel, I've had you back on because I feel like you had you on in Edinburgh and you were the last guest of the Edinburgh run. And I feel like I, I didn't, I was, I felt like I was wasting your time and I was a bit disrespectful to you. Um, and then I had you, then I made you come to Winchester. <laughs> And just uh, the devil in me made just thought I'll waste his time again. I'll just do it I just, one more I just time. like the idea I never actually ever get asked to do Leicester Square. Have you done Richard Harry's Leicester Square Theatre podcast? Yeah, I've done it about three times now. All right, where have you done it? Leicester Square. No, uh, Edinburgh, <laughs> uh, Winchester, and then my house. <laughs> <laughs> that's not my fault. You can't pin that on me. That one's no, not no, my fault. No, that's true, um, actually. So I just thought I'd like to apologise for the disrespect I've shown you. I think that it's two times. I wouldn't do it. I'm not going to – it's not like I'm going to get you out here a third time just to waste some more of your time doing this. I'm going to treat you with respect. I mean, I'm sure right, – Where's this you know, going? You, Immediately I'm thinking – you got to ask me about if there's a second Top Coppers series or something. I've been waiting. I've been doing press-ups over that question. That's become more famous than the bloody show. Oh, Top Coppers. Yeah, that's the question Richard Erin asked you if it was coming back five years later. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a show as well. Don't forget that. Yeah, but I only heard of it because uh, Richard Erin couldn't stop laughing asking if it was coming back. Oh, right. Okay. Uh well, you can watch it on the director's website because the BBC haven't got it either. Bond? Well. <laughs> no, I was. I, that was the furthest thing from my mind. I was thinking about how COVID must have hit you quite hard. I imagine, I don't know anything about your personal life, but I'm just guessing. <laughs> and, you know, also, it must have really disrupted the filming of the, the new series of there Top Coppers. There, there we go. There we go. I'm glad I, I'm absolutely, I smelt it. I smelt it. Stand up for hero. I don't even you made that up. I've never even I've never even heard of it. You're trying to you know, you're trying to get me into the you know, you put a little a bit of cheese outside the mouse hole. I'm like, stand up hero. Is that me? Bang. <laughs> no, um, I imagine there's a lot in the can and then just like, you need to do the reverse shots and uh, then just COVID hit and just been waiting. But the other bloke's doing well, only from from top coppers. He's doing all right. <laughs> should I, I should get him on? He's doing well, isn't he? I saw him on. He's on Catherine Ryan's thing. Oh Didn't he get God. married to Sarah Pascoe as well? I heard. He's doing well. He's doing well for himself. He hasn't. He had, unlike some people, he hasn't sat back going, "When's Top Coppers coming back?" I'm just. I'm sitting here until Top Coppers comes back. He's got out there and done some other stuff, John. That's all I'm saying. Fuck me. He he's married Sarah Pascoe. Yeah, <laughs> he's done. He's in Catherine. Catherine. He's very good in Catherine. Yeah, thing. great. Good for. <laughs> Very I'm very good. happy for. I him. feel like he does a he does like a version of his Top Coppers character, but he's taking it. You haven't on seen Top Coppers. What are you talking about? You haven't seen it. You don't know what you're talking about. You haven't even. You don't even know what this show is. 
It's I've a, it's a, a of it. you've seen a clip. <laughs> I, mean, yeah, I mean, to be honest, again, <laughs> you can't see it, so I can't really have a go at you because there's actually no way of fucking seeing it. Yeah, Steen's doing great. I'm yeah, doing great. I'm, do, I'm doing absolutely fine. You know, I'm not. Yeah, I'm fine. Uh, I don't know why you're being so defensive. I'm, I'm, I'm not. not I'm not. I'm not being defensive. But I just get the feeling that every year you're going to ask me to do this, and <laughs> I get the feeling because I, you know, you're in a you're in a position of power. The day I could respond to you and go, do you know what? I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to buy a ticket <laughs> for the day that you've asked me to do, and I'm going to sit in the front row. Christ, if I'm fifty. And you're, I don't know how old you'll be then. <laughs> old. And you're asking me if there's going to be a second series of top fucking <laughs> coppers. If I've got the money, I'll make it. Okay. Well, if I've got the money, I'll oh, make it. Oh, really? Oh, really? Yeah, oh, really? I'll make it, but I'm going to, I want to be in. It's going to be top coppers, but there's going to be an extra copper and it's going to be me. And I'm in every scene. Well, no, apparently oh, and... Steen's doing so well. He won't, he won't want to do it. <laughs> well, so I'll, you... do Ste- I'll do Steen's part. But well, I, no, it doesn't work. That bits. doesn't work because the, the 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 he was you know he was tall and kind of he's the kind of he was the brooding one, and I was the. Uh, I can do that. Well, I I think we're similar height. Yeah. So how can you do that? I just act it. I act it. You're, you're like taller. Yeah. What you just looked so even in the two shot, you'll still look down at my shoes, even though I'm looking at your face. And I'm thinking, why is he looking down at my shoes? <laughs> Rich, it, this isn't a single, this is a double shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I'm acting taller. Yeah, but he's he's looking at you. <laughs> oh fuck me. It'd be like Gandalf, you know, he cried because he uh he McKellen cried because he 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 only did stuff on green screen. And he was like crying because he went, this isn't what acting is. I should be with people. You'll be like that, crying on green screen going, where's John? <laughs> In this, we'll make it happen. You know, we'll like, you bought, you know like you bought the tapes. You know you bought yeah. your tapes off the BBC. You yeah. could buy the costume and the set off them. And uh, we could, I don't know, you live in the countryside, there's some space where we can... We'll make it happen. I'm going to do uh, Improvisation, My Dear Watson. You can be in that as well. I'll put you, I can get you in it. Yeah. Improvisation, My Dear yeah. Watson. I'm bringing that back. Um, I had an idea for another one I was going to bring up, what I was thinking about. I can't remember this. The top covers, that's fit for the moment. Once we, we're making so a what, bit you're of, making we're a making... channel of stuff that got cancelled. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to bring and, it back. And you're in all of it? Yeah, I'm going to be in it, yeah. Well, <laughs> I'll take it at the moment. Yeah, I'll do it. I'll take it. We'll pay you. It'll be better than TV rates. Look, I'm being facetious because you are actually on TV. You're on TV right now. You've got a series on TV right now. I mean, I'm on the ropes. Early doors. <laughs> I don't know. We're 15 minutes in and I'm absolutely on the ropes here. You just, so look, you just, uh, I know, we can joke I know, about you, top coppers. Yeah, we can joke about top coppers. I know how the next 10, 15 minutes goes. We can joke about top coppers, but let's let's get serious for a second and talk about guessable. I know how this goes. I've listened to every I watched, bloody episode. I watched an episode of guessable today, and you're in that. You're like uh, Lloyd Grossman to David Frost in, uh, through the keyhole. That's your role. You're like... Um, Richard Osman to Alexander Armstrong in Pointless. You're like <laughs> right. Alex Horn, in very like Alex Horn to Greg Davis in Taskmaster. What you're most like, though, is nobody to Richard Osman in House of Games. That's what you're most like. Well, as You I... play the role that in House of Games, Richard Osman doesn't bother having the bloke there. <laughs> Look. That's what it's most like. I... Uh... As I said to you, if I'd been asked to do any television over the past five years, if someone had said, John, would you like to do Taskmaster? Would you like to go on House of Games? I'd have then realised when I was filming episodes of Guessable, the similarities. But the truth is, out of spite, I've never watched anything because I'm thinking, well, if they don't ask me, I'm not watching it. And, uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know what the legal... I think it's good. I think you are... I don't know what the legal... (laughs) There's a couple of rounds that are a little bit like House of Games. I, I don't. You know, I it's no idea. What happens? What happens on TV is like you know what's interesting. Both Taskmaster and House of Games. 
which in a way you could say, you know, guessable, is like those two shows had met and had a child and created another show. Um, both of them were met resistance from the TV, TV companies. And then when they're successful, then people want to make other things a bit like them. But seriously, if I can be just serious for a moment, John, you're very good on it. It's a very good, it's a very entertaining and very funny show. It's a show where, where comedians and celebrities mess around, do stupid games. And that's what, that's what's happening a bit on the telly at the moment. That's but that's the, that's the, that's the only fucking work I get. I'm on the proper Taskmaster, by the way, John. I should just say I'm on the actual Taskmaster. Well, I mean, you're the bloody you're the shark jumping over. You're, you're, the, you're the shark in happy. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, well, I've, I've never been asked to do it, but at least Richard Aaron ain't been asked to do it. You see that trailer happen, you're like, well, there we go. <laughs> That's it. I imagine uh, imagine you had a lot of fun. You got paid a fuckload of money. Yeah. And uh, timing couldn't be better as we go into a second lockdown. I mean, <laughs> you're absolutely laughing, Richard. Whereas Guessable was on a channel which even the exec doesn't have. So uh... <laughs> I watched it. You can watch online. You watch online, and the nice thing is the advertisers the advertisers respect it so much there aren't even any adverts on it. They, I think the advertisers have gone, look, we don't want to spoil this by putting adverts in the middle. So it goes to advert breaks, and then there are no adverts, and that's the respect that the advertisers are holding for, for you and the work you're doing. <laughs> what, does it go straight? <laughs> it goes to an advertising break. And you know, like you watch anything else online, it goes to an advertising break, and there's four or five adverts in it. It goes to an advertising break, then it comes straight back to the show. It's good, man. I, I, people should watch it. I watched one whole episode all the way through. And what I liked about it is the final round. The whole game, it's, it's got a unique selling point. The whole game, all the answers feed into guessing the identity of something else at the end, right, John? I'm not taking the piss. It's good. I love games. I, look, it's the only way to get on TV now. Well, is to this be is the thing. This is the thing. I mean, a pandemic wiped out every bit of work I had. <laughs> and then you get a call going... Uh... We're filming eight episodes in four days of a guessing game. Sign me. I'll pay you to do that. It's basically, I, I have a box in the corner of the studio. And um, every answer given to each game during the episode relates <laughs> to the... Obliquely. <laughs> <laughs> The it relates in an impossible way to get the put. It's impossible to answer it. <laughs> to the person yeah. in the box. So at the end, Sarah would go, right, teams, all the answers were this. Think about, and basically everything mentioned in the show is linked to the person in the box. It's clever. It's a clever twist. And so then it's, good. it's who's in the box. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think I'm revealing too many trade secrets. They, uh, it, it was guessed a few times. All right, okay. So, uh, you know. And even if you're winning the game, if you get that last question, then you've won the game. That's what it's so like. It's a, it trumps the whole thing. It's good. You're very good on it, John. It's lovely to see you on the television where you, I'm not going to say belong, because I think you belong in a, a very fringe theatre performing your weird comedy. But it's nice for you to get out of there and uh, be on the television. <laughs> oh, man, a lot. Yeah. Well, look, I'm I'm not slagging the program off because, in the event that there's a second well, series, oh, I know exactly. <laughs> I'm very happy to come on. I, you know, it's it's right in my uh, right up my street. You have to do impressions. <laughs> I'm, I'm you have to do well. draw. It's good. Well, yeah, you got to do impressions. It's good. It's absolutely. I love it. I love it. But uh, yeah, it's it's sort of just weird the way TV works. It's just weird the way commissions work and that they they. You know, they'll say no to something and then something happens. They go, oh, we'll do that. Yeah, now we'll do it. We'll do something else with, that's like that. Rather than thinking, let's do the thing that's, you know, let's uh, take the punt on it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm drunk. You met um, you met uh, Eamon Holmes on uh, Guessable as well? Yeah. You ever met him? Yeah, he's in, he interviewed me about my la my emergency questions book. Uh, and I said to him before the interview, it was all live interview, I said, look, if you're going to pick out questions from this book, just be careful. Some of them are pretty rude. So just just read through it. Before you read them out, <laughs> just check them. It was this book here. Where's it gone? This It was the original hardback. He opened it up. 
and goes, are you the postman or the letterbox? Brilliant questions like, are you the postman? <laughs> Uh, 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 so yeah, but he was you no, know, he was he was perfectly okay. But you know, you do that when you go to those when you're doing that thing where you're going on the radio shows. You know, even with this book, which you, all you have to do is read two pages of it, and you know what it is, right? You don't. It's not like a novel, and even with that, you know they haven't looked at it, and so that was him going, "Oh, look, it's I know it's full of questions," and then just reading questions. They haven't even looked to go. I'll just, I'll just underline one question I'm going to read out just to make sure it's fine. No. Uh, so he does his job. He's a professional man. He didn't even know he, he was Googling Sarah Pascoe in the makeup chair. Right. And a picture of Catherine Ryan came up and he went, oh, yeah, I know who that is. It's the American one. Well, you know, he's mad. He is. Absolutely- what happened? There was something. What happened? Did he, did he mistake you for someone else? What's the well, story? That- well, basically, his episode record, he walked off set. One of the games is uh, you've got a, three people have a box. Yeah? Yeah. And uh, one of them has something in their box, and the other two are lying. Yeah. So Sarah went, open your box, Eamon. And he opened his box, and he looked in it, and he said, I don't know what it is. And he closed <laughs> the lid. And everyone's looking at him like, what the hell's going on? So Sarah goes over, looks in his box, and she went, well, you do know what that is. <laughs> so she sits down, and he put, he just goes, uh, I, I want to sp- I want to speak to a producer, please. I want to speak to a producer. And he just sits there, and he walks off set for five minutes. I went over to Sarah, and I said, "What's what the fuck's in his box? What's upset him? And it was a bit of paper that said, a guidebook to Basingstoke. And apparently he'd gone to the producer and went, I've never been to Basingstoke. I don't even know where the hell it is. How am I supposed to come up with what's in a guidebook to Basingstoke? And the guy was like, well, it's just a game. Make it up. And he went, well, I don't know what it is. Even though someone later found out where he lives, his train would have gone through to Basingstoke. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, afterwards, I, I'm walking back to my dressing room. I went, all right, see you later, Eamon. And he went, are you sure I've never met you before? And I'm like, never met you before. He went, are you sure? He goes, are you sure I didn't interview you on this morning as Father Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> and I went, I went, no. I went, no, that ain't me. And he went to me, well, if the work ever dries up, your Father Christmas. <laughs> and, you know, I think I'd have been in my rights to, like, turn the fuck off or something. But I just walked off. I was like, what the fuck's going on? He's mad. Has he interviewed me on this morning of Father Christmas? And then that week, he interviewed a Father Christmas on this morning, saying that Christmas had come early. And he must have thought, I don't know, I was like, has he asked this guy on this, you know, has he asked this guy who's come in dressed as Father Christmas? Oh, nice to see you again. That game, that game show was a laugh. It's like, what the fuck are you talking? I've got, I mean, I don't know if he was power playing. I don't know if he was driving. I don't know what was going on. If the work dries up, your Father Christmas. Jesus Christ. I think you could be, you could be Tim Allen in the Santa Claus just as he's on his way to becoming Father Christmas. That's what you could be. You could be like the, one of the, He's you know, one of the me. intermediate He's stages. Me. This show's shit. You're shit. You're not going to have any work at Christmas, mate. But don't worry. Your father Christmas. The way he lent in. He's a big guy as well. Yeah. Oh, my word. I mean, this guy's been on TV <laughs> day of my life, I think, for about four hours. <laughs> He's done more TV, I think, you know, I don't know, top five people that have done loads of TV. Him, yeah. uh, Wogan, probably. Wogan did a lot. No, not anymore. That's... Well, no. Obviously. You're just going for Irish people. You're just going for the Irish people who are on TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dermot O'Leary, he's done X Factor. <laughs> 
Daro Brains on all the time. Daro Brains on all the time. Jimmy Carr. He must have done it. Jimmy Carr's done a lot of TV. Jimmy Carr's done a lot of TV, but not over as long a time period as Holmes. No, but that's, Maybe, that's Holmes' Maybe, trip. Maybe. Holmes goes, yeah, I'm on TV, but you're all idiots. You do half-hour shows, hour shows. I'm on for six hours every morning. I don't know. Good. No, it's good, man. It's good. Hey, look, I'm just drinking some whiskey, and that's... Uh, Chris, that's a great little... You could cut to the thing that you've got to put in here when we do the podcast. Cheers. Um, what, we, what, what, uh, what whiskey is that? There's a, this is uh, Glenlivet. Uh, this is 12 years old Glenlivet. Wow. They sponsor the podcast. Oh, look, it's like it's part of it's on Mars. Uh, they have sponsored the podcast, uh, and uh, do, actually do send, just uh... going into that bit is a bit where... Then I'm, I'm going to talk to a lady who does cocktails. Well, I've done it already. I've already talked to her. And then that goes into the the show. And it, it'll be seamless now because I'm just drinking whiskey. I think it's a little bit too late into the show, but we'll make it work. We'll have to make this a long show. We started a bit late, so it's not too bad. Do you send guests a bottle? I, I can send you a bottle if you like, John. They, get, they gave me four bottles. I would have done it for four bottles of whiskey. That's the <laughs> thing. They didn't realise. Four? They didn't, Is that what? <laughs> they, they, they didn't realise. I'd have gone five, and they'd have gone four, and gone, okay. <laughs> four. Like, four. They lose four. Four gets four's like gets lost in a stock tape. We might have to cut that bit out, but we might not. Let's see. Um, what, are you, good. Uh, what are you uh, reading at the moment? What am I reading at the moment? Yeah. Uh, I have just read uh, Michael Ian Black's uh, book, A Better Man, which I had read because he was the guest a couple of weeks ago. I'm just going to read Nell Scavell's book again, which is a brilliant writer who wrote, she came up with Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Oh, yeah. And she uh, wrote the, you know, the Simpsons episode, Blowf, the two fish, wayfish, blowfish, one of the early ones about the blowf. I think it's the one where uh, Homer eats a bit oh, of yeah, fish yeah, and yeah, thinks he's yeah. going to die. Fantastic. I think that's her one. It's either that one or the one with three eyes. Anyway, she writes for The Simpsons, and her book is amazing. I've read it before, but I'm going to read it again uh, as she's going to be my guest in a couple of weeks. And I do recommend you tune into that one because she's going to be awesome. It's another trans. It's tra- I'm getting people from transatlantic places, literally America, because that's the most transatlantic place you can get. Uh, so I've been reading that. What are you reading? Uh, well, actually. The reason why I asked is I saw I, yeah. I have a book which um, I've I've been unpacking some boxes and hang on it's over here. Also, apparently, you know, speaking of the Atlantic, I was re- when you uh, when you're salting pasta, yeah, it should be salty as salty as the Mediterranean, not the Atlantic. Okay, I don't put salt in any food that I cook. Or any food that has been cooked, I don't use salt at all, except on maybe fish and chips. That's it. But do you eat salted butter? Yeah, but I don't put salt in it. I'm not saying I never eat salt, but I don't put salt in anything. If I'm cooking, I don't put salt in. If I'm, if I've got something, well, what are you going to do when you're old? Because that's all you can taste. Well, I'll, then I'll start putting salt in, maybe. But I don't. You know, if you know, if you don't have it, you don't. You don't miss it. I did when. When I was a kid, my mum put salt in everything. I'm sure when I started cooking stuff for myself, I put salt in things, but I don't put salt in anything now. And as as a result, I will live for a thousand years. Old people That's put salt. Old people put salt like sauce, don't they? Yeah, they, yeah. Sp- they sprinkle it over the. Uh... Anyway, this book here. Yeah, I was unpacking. I thought of you here. Have you heard of a book called? It's by a guy called Gay Talese. It's called The Voyeur's Motel. I have not heard of either of those things. Caterley's The Voyeur's Motel. No, I haven't. Uh, right. Is, the, it, is the, it about me? Was it that time <laughs> I stayed in the motel and I felt someone was watching me? Wait, it's a, <laughs> Was he making it's a, notes? <laughs> well, well, Caterley's is like, yeah. uh, he's an author of like, um, not, not an author, sorry. He's a journalist, like, you know, like gonzo journalism. I do, Hunter yeah. Hunter S. Thompson kind of guy. Mm-hmm. He got a call one day from this bloke going, will you meet me? I've got something that I think is very interesting <laughs> that um, opens the door to the human mind. So, you know, yeah. Gatorlees is like, yeah, I'll turn up, meet you. 
Right. This guy hands over about 500 pages of handwritten notes. This guy owns, this guy owned a motel and he built, he basically went up into the uh, roof of the motel and drilled holes in all of the rooms (laughs) and made notes over five, I think five, 10 years. And he didn't, he didn't do any, he wasn't sexually aroused by it. He just made notes about how people had sex. And he handed over these notes and went, do you want to write a book about it? Do you want to, uh, you know, you could do what you want with it. Inform the authorities and have you sent to prison? No, but look, there's pictures of him. And it it's genuinely a fascinating book. Okay. In that. There's a Netflix documentary about this called Via Latchmore tells me on uh, chat room. Oh, is there? Mm. Well, uh, that's what Latchmore says. I don't know how trustworthy they are. <laughs> they could just be. They could just. Someone else is saying it. John six five two. Oh, I do. Tr- John T six five two. I trust him. He's saying it too. Oh right. Well, I'll watch that because it's it's fucking mad, and also it's just depressing because everyone having sex is like. It's just crap, and he just writes. He just writes like how boring everyone is, and how sad it is, and the bloke would get up and just have a wash, and it lasts for minutes. And but then that's the beauty of it, in that it, it is absolutely real life. Yeah, it is completely real. But you know, if you're going to a motel to have sex, you're probably not. You know, you're not pulling out all the stops, are you? I once went to I once went to a oh I I I once went to a hotel with my then girlfriend both living at home and the guy went there's I've booked it and he goes there's no room here you got to go to our sister hotel I'm like what are you all about I booked a room here he went no 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 you got to go to the other one so I'm like what the hell anyway we got a cab there it wasn't it was like you know a mile away it was it wasn't like and uh, the guy, the guy went, right, here's your room. Your lock doesn't work, but uh, don't worry. There's a guy watching 24 hours. And he just pointed to this bloke sat at the end of the corridor, just sat down on a chair looking at me. And so I, we shut the door and went, what the fuck? We can't lock the door. <laughs> oh, my God. But, you know, when you're, how old was I? I don't know, 19? You just kind of think, yeah, it's probably quite normal to be moved to hotels and <laughs> there's no locks, but don't worry, there's that guy. Can you see him down there? Yeah. He'll make sure no intruders come in. Well, I'm not really worried about intruders. It's more him. Yeah, don't worry about him. Well, who's he? Just don't worry about him. <laughs> Awful hotel. Yeah. Awful hotel. God, man. You look back at where the places you stay – well, as a comedian, you stay in lots of... I've stayed in a place... I, I was in Lincoln and my car broke down and I had to find someone lit. It was like Bethlehem on Jesus's birthday. Everywhere was full. And I got a room that cost £15, including breakfast. <laughs> and it wasn't that long ago. It was like in the noughties. But it was, 15 quid? It was not that long ago. It wasn't like the 1980s. It was £15 in 2005, maybe. £15, including breakfast, and a room above a pub. Uh, and it was... Like the door had clearly recently been kicked in and slightly repaired. <laughs> oh, Christ. And there was just noises of shouting men all night of these people who slept in this 15 pound, <laughs> basically a homeless hostel, I'm guessing. What? Where, if you know, you've got your 15 quid together, you begged off the streets. And then if you want, you can go down and have, I mean, what would you get for your breakfast? I mean, the breakfast. If it's fifteen, the fifteen pounds, quid was surely for the breakfast. That room, but a proportion of it has to be for the room, including the sheet. I mean, it's just very difficult to see where they made their margins on fifteen pounds. Uh, I can only imagine they did it by not cleaning any sheets. Oh dear. Well, happy days. Let's ask you an emergency question. How how do you feel about that? I, I've got a new emergency question. I've only asked uh, one person this. Oh. You're, the sec- you're the second person I'm going to ask. Who, who else did you ask? Stevie Martin. Yeah, yeah. Last week. Brilliant. How many graters do you own? 
in your house or flat? How many graters? And do think carefully about it because anything that can be used for grating. So I thought I had two, but then I thought, oh, no, I've got that bowl that you can grate on top of as well with a little grater attachment. And I've got a, a blender that you can grate with. So I've got, I think I've got at least four, probably a couple of other, but I reckon I might have five or six. It's just a gauge of how successful you're being in your career, this as well, how many it is. Well. Do you have a grater? Well, yeah. Well, I've got, I've got. All right, no, I'm not going to assume you've got a grater. But that's the presumed. Well, what, the, the grater decimal, I've got right? has four sides of different yeah. edge. Oh, well, that counts as one, that counts as one grater, what, four-sided grater. Well, that's four, no, that is four graters. There's, there's well, the it's there's arguably the, more because like the four sides have diff, a couple of those sides have uh, slices and they have different grades of grater on them. Yeah, you've got the parmesan one. So is that six? There's very small holes, but sometimes there's a slicer on the same side as that. The top part is is parmesan, and then there's a slicer thing underneath it. You got parmesan, cheddar. Uh, it counts as one. It's one. All right. Well, I've got, okay, I've got two. Then. I've got two. I've got. Okay. I've got that one. You're doing right. And I've got uh, like uh, a thing to grate your feet. <laughs> I've got one of those as well. I've got my wife bought. My wife hates the. Well, I she, she hates the fact that I pick up my feet all the time. That's what. That's my main hobby. That's what you don't Do you not wear let socks? them know to. Uh, when I'm, you know, when I'm not shod, when I'm unshod and un unsocked, unstockinged. What's the most? Um, um... Considering you spent 500 quid on a jumper. Yeah. Well, what's the most expensive the... socks you've ever bought? Um, I just bought a pair of pants for £33. I know that wasn't what you asked. One pair? But I just, one pair, £33. I could have got three, and they were posh pants. And I just thought, I want to see whether these pants are worth £33. <laughs> are you, are you just... wearing them now? I'm not wearing them now. I'm wearing, and what I'm wearing now is some old pants and the, uh, What's happened with all these pants I bought about three or four years ago, all of them have started to degrade just in the perineum area for some reason. There's a hole about that big mm. in uh, in a lot of my pants, just right between betwixt the ball area and the arse area. Yesterday, I was they wasn't wearing these ones yesterday. The, one, the pair I was wearing yesterday, stuff started popping out. I thought I was sitting in my pants. Stuff started popping out, and I thought, right, I have to throw those ones away. That's when that's the decision I make on pants. I don't they know. Have to uh, degrade, they have to degrade to the point where they've gone that far. Um, I don't know what I'm more depressed about. Whether I, uh, I'm listening to this or that I, I've actually heard you talk about this a number of times before. <laughs> Not this exact problem. I've got there's you know I have an issue because I buy I bought some new pants. One of them is this thirty three. I bought one pair of thirty three pound pants. And then I bought like some ten pound pants, which is still quite expensive for pants. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what, what nice make pants. are they? Thirty three quid. Paul Smith. Paul Smith. Paul you Smith. can get Paul Smith. You get a pack of three for about thirty three, or you can get like one pair of super duper pants. I got a. Uh... Not sure. There's. I'm not sure they're three times as good. We'll see. Time will tell. Maybe they don't degrade in the perineum area. But I got. A... I won't wear the new pants until the old pants. Have disintegrated <laughs> <laughs> because I don't. So I would rather. What? So you've got? So you've just got the? Just, so you've just got the elastic band, or do they all have to disappear? No. The minute my yesterday, I was sitting in my uh, in the lounge with my wife watching telly, yeah. and I'd taken my trousers off just for you know comfort. That's what happens when you're 53. Not wasn't a sexual thing, and one of my one of my testicles. Yeah popped out through the hole and I thought that's too far that's it. and then my what I told I said to my wife do you like that is that sexy and she said no and then I said and she said you have to throw those away and I said oh, I'll throw these away but all my pants are on the way to this state but I'm not whilst they're holding everything in it's fine but once things start flopping out they're no longer pants so I'll throw them out but I you know I've got good pants that I could be wearing but I feel I should get through the old pants first especially in lockdown I don't want to waste my good pants on lockdown, but even, so that's my conundrum. I've got I've got cereal bowls that are a bit chipped around the edge, just a bit chipped. Yeah. And the question is, do you put those at the back of the cupboard and only use them on you know desperate occasions, or John, do you put them at the front of the cupboard and use them every time in case you drop them or they break? 
and then you haven't wasted it, you haven't chipped a new bowl, what would you do in that situation? That's my question to you. <laughs> would you he, go for the would you back <laughs> and, and waits for my answer? What would you do in that situation? Because that is that says well, a lot know, about like, a man. No, but you use like your pants. You use it for other stuff, don't you? So you kind of go, well, this is now a rag which I can use uh, if I'm painting and decorating, or if yeah, I need I to if I need to block a pipe or something. Yeah, I remember. I clearly remember one of my main memories of childhood is my mum using my dad's pants as dusters and things once they were passed there. <laughs> Under the sink, there was a load of my dad's pants. <laughs> and that's one of my main memories of childhood. Are you not, are and you that's joking? why I will, not use, I will not use my Paul Smith pants. I'm not going to I'm not going <laughs> to insult them. They're expensive pants. They're not that good. They're not 30 pounds good. And um but once they're over in the bin with a bit of risk, maybe even bury them in the garden in a in a makeshift grave. <laughs> give them the respect they deserve. I'm not going to put them in a stuff them in a pipe. What what are you doing with pipe pants in a pipe? And you haven't answered my question that I asked. About bowls, <laughs> you've gone into back to pants. I asked you about bowls. Well, and you've, you've got judged that question. You've got two like young, a politician. You've got two young kids, so I, I are you, you're, you, you know, I don't know. Things are flying all over. The, things are flying around. So I don't know. I'm guess I'm. Uh, I don't know what I'm doing with it. I don't know. You smash it. I don't know. You smash it up. Make a mosaic well, that's out what of it. Joe Corfer, the only other person I've asked about this joke the balls is Joe Corfer. He said, oh, I would, if it's the minutes it's chipped, I'd smash up and use it in the garden or you'd do it in the garden. It's a perfectly surfaceable. I'll show, I'll bring it in. I'll bring it up next week. There's one that's a bit more chipped than the others. Is it? Uh... It, still work, it still works as a bowl, but I say use that bowl. Use it until it breaks because you until don't want to break a new bowl. Everything you why, why do, why, everything you use seems to use the bowl till it breaks. Wear your pants till they disintegrate. Like everything has to wear down to the nub. It does. That is that is life. Well, yeah, I suppose life is so. degradation. My dad uh, he shat his pants once at a parents' evening, and it, obviously I didn't know until we're driving home, and he's crying with laughter. He can't stop laughing, and you know when you're a kid. Your dad, well, my dad, he, he was always laughing. But you know when, as a kid, you're like, you're looking at something that really makes adults laugh and you're like, what the hell are they laughing? Like, I've not seen them like this before. He was going mad in the car because he, he'd shat himself. And you know when at parents' evening they open the teacher's toilets and like that's kind of an exciting thing that you can use a teacher's toilet. He took them off and shoved them uh, behind one of the... Uh, one of the uh, one of the toilets because he just completely uh, and it, I remember it was my history teacher and he just had to stand up and leave and I was like where the hell is he going I don't know what I don't know what happened but he completely shat his pants yeah good did you uh, did you ever when you had parents evening did you ever have a treat. I didn't have a don't think I did get a treat. What did you get a treat after parents' evening? Yeah, got Mc, got McDonald's. Did you? Yeah, that was yeah, a, we never we weren't allowed McDonald's. Well no, neither was I, that's why it was a treat. But we weren't even allowed them as a treat. I was I was I'd say I was sixteen the first time I had a wimpy. Really? Yeah. What was a treat then for you as a kid? Not being beaten <laughs> that night. <laughs> With a with a belt, uh, I got a pack of minstrels every Friday whilst I watched Captain Caveman. That was my treat. Wow! Every Friday, that was one pack of chocolate a week. I chose minstrels, ate them watching Captain Caveman. You remember those minstrels? Uh, what were they called? They they were released for about a couple of years. Nestle did them. There was like white chocolate in the brown shell. Yeah. Were they topsy turvy? Topsy turvy. No, it wasn't called Topsy Turvy. Dom uh, something like Domino or something. Vice versa, someone's yeah. saying. I think that might be right. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, vice versa is the uh, consensus. Entropy, someone has also said in the uh, chat room, is what I was trying to say. 
about the everything entropies, doesn't it? That's what life is. Everything entropies. That's a good title for this sweet show. I'll put that in. Do you write your own notes for the podcasts? Yeah, that's what that's what I'm. Ah, uh, these books. No, sell not those. For... The ones on the pod, The ones on the. Um, the ones on the on the phone. Uh, oh yeah, really? Yeah, they're quite yeah. in depth. I have. I have to try and remember the next day what happened, and I never can remember, and I don't want to watch it back. It really is a struggle. This one's going to be a terrible struggle to remember what's happened. I should be making notes as I go. <laughs> Doesn't matter. No one reads them, do they? I do. Chris Evans put the wrong one up this week today. Oh, really? Yeah. Someone did notice, to be fair. So someone, someone's reading them. Put the last week's up on this week's. He's, You know, he's good, apart from being quite incompetent. Ah. Uh, you having a nice time? I'm sorry I was rude to you. I was a bit rude to you earlier. I'd just like to apologise. And the other two times you've been on. <laughs> just like to... Um, <laughs> just want to apologize. I just feel like it was a bit rude. No, I, 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 I genuinely... Um, I don't remember... I, I rude. No one can be rude to me. No. I, I, I don't know if you're similar, but I just... Anyone can say anything to me, really, and I'll just be like, "All right," but but it's probably a bit true, probably exaggerated for effect. Uh, yeah, it's probably quite funny. Yeah, well done. <laughs> I take it as a badge of honour. Yeah, that I can. Uh, the people I'm rude to are like, uh, it's the people that you like when. I listen to your podcast. There are moments where you don't know whether you can say what you want to say sometimes because maybe the person in front of you is a massive star or something. Yeah. Whereas what you want is when I'm listening to you, you want you going in hard, (laughs) just really no regrets, and then slowly pulling it back over an hour. So to be, to be actually, to be actually in it, yeah, is uh, it's an absolute joy. No, well, I, 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 you're, you're one of my all-time favorite guests. Out of the people who nobody knows who they are, you're the definitely the best one. Well, I remember when I was, uh, I remember <laughs> years ago thinking, yeah, oh, I'll never go on that show if he ever asked me because he's, uh, I only want to go on it when people know who I am. And then you know, the years went by, and I thought, "Well, <laughs> I don't want people to know who I am, though." Yeah, I don't. You don't yeah, I don't want people to know who I am. It's a terrible thing. That's the worst thing. And yeah, I like the idea that you know, I did guessable. Right, there were thirty-four guests on that thing. People like Claire Baldwin. People like. Uh, yeah, Martin Kemp, Eamon Holmes. I mean, if, if Eamon Holmes was played this, he'd go, who the hell is that guy? He'd go, what is this story? How, where was he in the room? And he'd be like, he was the guy at the desk. What? I don't remember him. Yeah, and you said this to him. Did I? Fuck me, I don't remember this. <laughs> Laura Whitmore. You know, these people don't know. Right? They're saying hello to me. It's like, yeah, I'm the guy in the corner. Right, okay. I've got the box. Yeah, mate, you do. You know, we've all got to make a living somehow. All right, mate. But thank it's God good. that came what? in. I, I have to be honest. Here. With, with yeah. this pandemic, you know, I was going to go to Melbourne, do the comedy festival out there. I had a week of a tour to go, Edinburgh. All of it gone. So, joking aside, I'm extremely grateful that Somebody phoned up and went, <laughs> we, we thought of you to do this show. and um, You're good. It's a good choice. Will you do and it? Pasco's good too. You're, but everyone's good on it. Alan I Davies. Think, I think, I've I, never met Alan I, Davies before Alan, in my life. Good. I, would, I'd, I think it's such it, – the only thing with Alan Davies, and I think he's great, is it felt like quite a fresh – I mean, a younger – you know, I know that you're all like in your 30s and 40s, but it feels like you're the the new generation of comedians. And I feel like 
maybe they should have had a younger person being the other show host, or someone else who was a newer person. But De- but he's good. He's good. But I understand why they went for Alan. Yeah, and he's very good in it. But that's that's all I would. When does uh, he's, he's when does Taskmaster he's- when does Taskmaster start again? <laughs> Tomorrow, it's got quite a lot of old folk. It's got uh, no, but know, Richard, one, you know, one, you know how showbiz works. You, put- you need the viewers. You do. And you people do, are you tuning do. in to see Alan and Sarah. That's the truth. That's of it. true. And so I, I was very true. grateful he was there because also, you know, when someone like him is on a show and Sarah and, you know, and Darren as well is fantastic. He's great as well. He, you know, it makes people go, oh, yeah, I'll do that. There are a lot of people there quite <laughs> – there are a lot of people there that probably can't get booked for QI <laughs> but really like <laughs> Alan Davies. And so they think, oh, yeah, nice way of meeting him. <laughs> But uh, yeah, no, I, I, I don't know. I, I, like you said, I don't know how TV works. Well, no one knows. No, it was one in really the same. Uh, it was in the same. Uh, the day before we recorded it, the studio had been used for Piers Morgan interviewing Colonel Tom, and I was in Colonel Tom's. Uh, I was in his. Um, I was in his dressing room. Yeah. And uh, in the bin was an empty can of uh, full fat Coke. <laughs> and I just imagined, I was like, Fuck, he must have been flying. I can't imagine Colonel Tom drinking a, <laughs> I couldn't dr- imagine him drinking a full fat Coke. <laughs> He's 100, he doesn't give a fuck anymore. I know, but that's what made me laugh. I was looking at it like, <laughs> this must have sent him crazy. Like the idea that they're like, <laughs> what would you like, Colonel Tom? A uh, can of Coke, please. <laughs> All right. We'll be back in a minute, yeah? Drink that. They come back. Chair's empty. Where the fuck? <laughs> Where the fuck's he gone? <laughs> He's doing Strictly in the next room. I don't know. Yeah, it's fun that when you get, we had the bit, we followed Lee and Herring. And I can't remember the name of the guy. He's the guy, he's an Irish, that Irish singer. And I think Father Ted took the piss out of him. Oh, um, oh, Dan, 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 uh, Daniel O'Donnell. Daniel, yeah, Daniel O'Donnell. O'Donnell. Yeah, well, whoever that is. And he was a big star. And his bin was just full of ripped up fan letters. <laughs> 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 and like maybe he'd responded to them all. <laughs> or maybe just gone. It was just like, a clean tear, <laughs> massive bulk. <laughs> Wait, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the envelope? Uh, I oh, I can't remember. I just remember that. I th- yeah, I like the, no, I, like I would. I, I would like to say if I'm I'm slightly libeling because he maybe he'd read them and, and and ripped them up once he'd replied to them. It just struck us, and we were just starting out on our careers, and he was obviously doing pretty well, and obviously fucked off with <laughs> all the attention. And we were not getting any fan mail. And, I always uh, make fa- sure we just found uh, it funny that you fuck you. I always make sure whenever I leave a dressing room or anything like that, the bin. You know, the bin is where people can learn about you. Yeah, well, that's it. Pissed and the me. toilet. You just yeah. got to make sure <laughs> they're. You know, just make sure pristine. they're pristine. Yeah. Flush the flush the bin contents down the toilet. That's what I do. Just to be safe. I did a gig once and uh, I was backstage and there was no toilet and I was absolutely going mad. So I just had to piss in a bottle and then put the bottle in the bag. Because I, you know, and I thought I'll throw it out on the way home. And I forgot about that thing about a week. And then I opened it. I remember opening it up thinking... (laughs) I couldn't remember what the hell it was. And then you just, how do you get rid of it? It's like when you cook something with oil. You shouldn't pour it down the, uh, you shouldn't pour it down the sink. No. So you've got to freeze it or something and then throw it in the bin. But I'm not freezing a bottle of my own piss. You can put piss, I mean, don't put it in the sink, put it in the toilet. Oh, yeah. It's only we. If you've got a toilet at home, right? <laughs> Don't yeah, pour it down your sink. I, I mean, they'll probably clean your sink yeah, out. Yeah, I forgot. No, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, toilet. 
I remember one New Year's Eve, this bloke was cooking breakfast. Uh, it was like a party. And um, we are all washing up. And he went and put all the beans down the toilet. And we were like, what the hell are you doing? And he was like, well, I always put my beans down the toilet. Because <laughs> he said, it was like, if you put it in the bin, it would just be soggy. But, you know, it's just beans, isn't it? And I've never forgotten that. I mean, I don't do it, but no. good idea. Put it down the toilet. It's just, it's going to go down there, isn't it? And beans just pass through pretty much unchanged. Well, so yeah, you, you can just shove, well. you know. Just shove, go out of the middle, man. Shove uh, co- cobs of corn down there, you know. <laughs> it'll, all, it'll, all co- it'll all go through. <laughs> Christ. It's come to this. <laughs> How long is this bloody thing? I mean, we've done enough. I mean, we can stop anytime. Well, but, no, you know, I mean, I'm quite equally... enjoying it. I'm quite enjoying it. Do you this remember in the my, early days my... of your podcast? Do you remember yeah. the early days where, I don't know if there wasn't restrictions, but you'd go on for ages. Yeah, we used to have one guest. And yeah, that was, do, that was it. We'd do like two hours probably, or certainly 90 minutes. And then it, and then when we uh, – I mean, we only ever have one guest a week anyway, obviously, uh, but – we tried to keep it in as a tight hour just in case we were to do anything in the second half. Oh, it's hard to keep up the pretense. Yeah, we tend to do an hour with the live shows now, but sometimes it creeps into 75 minutes. But, yeah, I think it did get up to a couple of hours with some of those early ones. And I like it. It's nice because now I'm back to doing one a week. We can go on if you want. I mean, you know, my I've got my wife waiting downstairs. <laughs> She's been drinking wine. I've been drinking whiskey. Yeah, she's really missing you sat there with your trousers off, a bollock peering through one of your uh, crotchless that's pants. Sexy, that's sex. Is that that's sexy? sexy? Is that sexy, a little bollock? Look at that, a little bollock. Weird the way, it's weird the way bollocks are not very sexy. I mean, they're sometimes used within sex itself. I mean, they obviously have a function within sex, and sometimes they are incorporated into sex. But they're not at all the things... That are involved in sex, bollocks are probably testicles are probably the least sexy thing. Would you say? I mean, they're not great to look at. They they're difficult to manipulate. I was. Uh, are you circumcised? I'm not. No. Are you? Sorry, I'm just. There's a fly here. I'm not clapping you. I got. I was circumcised when I was twenty-five. Were you? Yeah. Okay. Was that? Uh... You sat back like there's a story. I'm not. I mean... Yeah, there is a story where you did a change of religion, or did you have a, a medical issue, or did you just think this foreskin is just getting in my way? Let's whip it off. <laughs> and see how things are. You can't go back. Well, you can go back. Actually, you can. Uh... Can you? There are pit- well. There's. If you read my book, Talking Cock, there are people who dedicate their life to regrowing their foreskin. And one of the people who did that sent me about 200 pictures of his own penis. Um, I would say two to me and the female picture researcher of that book, <laughs> too many, too many pictures of his, of his regrown. You basically sort of start scratch, stretching the skin out quite slow. So you can get it back if, you, if you're missing it, John. No, I'm not missing it. It was you're a problem. It. What, was, what a problem. was the, uh, what was the cause of your, uh, it was too tight. Late, it was too late. tight. Yeah, yeah. It's very common, actually. I remember telling uh, friends, my brother, he got it done. It, it was, it was a nightmare. Looking back, I remember. What mine's I, nice and mine's nice and loose, John. Mine's <laughs> nice and loose. Good lord. <laughs> Jeez. It's just, it's just, it's just right. Just the right level of uh, looseness. It's not like flapping around. It's just well, it's loose taut, is it? But it's oh, it's gee. the right level of it's loose enough. I don't, loose it's not enough. Any problems? It's loose it's not, enough. If I'm running along naked, it doesn't fill up with air. No. <laughs> if I'm swimming in a pool naked, it doesn't fill up with water. <laughs> it just does its job. It's there, if there are brambles. It, There's a naked it, bloke in the pool. I, <laughs> well, is his foreskin blowing up? No, it looks perfectly loose. Okay, leave it. Leave him be. (laughs) 
Oh, Back to your me. story of the. Um... No, there's no story. It was just it was tight. It never. Yeah. It never. I didn't see the head of my penis till I was 25. Right. right. Okay. That's very late to realise that. Well, no, it wasn't. I knew. I realised when I was 18, and yeah. I went to the doctor, and then the doctor went, "Oh, yeah. no." I remember. I don't know why, but he went, "I'll call you and book a uh, I'll book an appointment," and then I didn't call it. He called me and I said, oh, "I've changed my mind." Because I was like, you know, it's obviously not a thing you um, you want done. Funnily enough, my dad picked me up from the hospital after my operation and, like parents evening, bought me a McDonald's. And I sat with my dad having a McDonald's. I thought he'd shat himself. <laughs> <laughs> like parents <laughs> Instead of shat myself. Right. How quick can you walk? Well, not really. Uh, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm I've just had half of my dick cut off. Yeah, well, we need to get out of it quick. I've shat my pants and I've shoved it down a cistern in uh, St. George's. Let's go and have a Big Mac. Yeah, all right, Dad. Love you. <laughs> no, I'm glad. No, but, you know, I think it, it's not talked about enough. You know, no one ever said to, no, no one ever said to me, mean, like, uh, that shouldn't be happening. You know, maybe uh, get it done. And it makes me think, if I ever had kids, would I get it done? You know, when, like, immediately. Well, I mean, don't get it done immediately. I mean, if you want to, you can. I, I, it's... In America, they get everyone gets it done, don't they? Well, they do. I think it's that's changing a little bit, but basically, yeah. But it's it's still a surgical procedure, so there's still risk and, st- and bad things happen as a result of uh, botched uh, circumcisions. So it's it's a it's a weird one within the book. Uh, Tom Rosenthal's done a yeah, show. Yeah, yeah, I saw about. that. Um, and, he will wait. Uh, right, yeah. Well, that's it. So you can you can try and pull it back. Did you have local anaesthetic or were you knocked out for the procedure? They knock you knocked out. Knocked so out. I've see? I've been knocked out four times in my life. I've had my appendix out. I've had my oh. foreskin cut off. Yep. I've had my tonsils gone. There's hardly any of you left. Amazing holding together. <laughs> I had an operation. What's the fourth on, one? Uh, when I was 13, I had an operation on my uh, gums and my teeth. Oh, yeah. The canine was growing into the root of the uh, Fuck, of the front tooth, so I had to go to St. Thomas's and uh, they put me to sleep and opened up my gums. Wow. And then to show that the canine was growing straight down, they attached a gold chain and they cemented the gold chain on the tooth, which was still up in the gum. And so the gold chain dangled down where the gap, where the gap, of the, where the gap was. Yeah. And so I had train tracks and then this gold, to- gold chain just hanging down. <laughs> I mean, you must have looked quite hard. That kind of, sounds like a kind of thing an extremely tough guy would do. Must have been quite well, intimidating. Have, have, cha- to have chains hanging down from their teeth. <laughs> yeah, like like one of those bead curtains. <laughs> Imagine trying to eat with just chains, <laughs> gold chains hanging down. Oh fuck me! Terrible. But you just you know you just. Imagine that mouth trying to learn German for five years. Absolute nightmare. <laughs> Was it five years of having the gold chain hanging out your mouth? No, about two. Two, two years. Because when you're a baby, the, have you ever seen that X-ray where your adult teeth are in your head? Yeah, yeah. It's insane, it's fine, isn't yeah. it? Absolutely insane. But it was growing into the root of my of my uh, so front teeth. I think they were just doing medical experiments on you, John. That doesn't sound like a thing. They put a jet chain in your mouth for two years. Sounds like they were. <laughs> It's the first stage of turning a human into a cyborg. They were working on that. Well, oh, I, I oh we've got to take your force. Next, we're taking your foreskin <laughs> off. We're going to replace it with this metal. We're putting a metal foreskin on. Put a, your appendix. Put a chain <laughs> mail around your bell. All right. Yeah, sure. Okay. What's going to happen when I'm 35? Just a letter comes through. We've got to, <laughs> we've got to take all your nails off. All right. We're going to put little, uh, you know, I don't know, fucking hell. Anyway. But everything, everything that you don't need is gone. You don't need your appendix. That's only to eat grass. 
Yeah. I remember I, I, I was in absolute agony with uh, appendicitis is one of the worst pains you can have. And my parents were thinking of selling the house at the time. And they, I remember a family walked into my bedroom looking at the room whilst I had appendicitis. Uh, no one believed I was in so much pain. <laughs> Tonsils, I don't know what you need that for. Just hangs there. Right. They're just taking off all the superfluous. I know. You don't need a foreskin. They're taking nipples. That's it. They're coming for your nipples <laughs> next, John. <laughs> John, we don't need your nipples. You're a bloke. Let's take them off. Let's just slice them off. Let's take them off. Put a couple of chains there. Yeah, some tassels. We can, pull, we can pull them. They're just using you for experiments. Yeah, I never. Yeah, you're completely right. My yeah. appendix. My full skin. just seeing what, and they go, let's try and take his heart out. Oh, no, he needed that. It turns out he needed that. That's, ah, oh, that was the thing. There'll be it's how much can we shave off a guy? It's like Robot Wars or something. They're just trying to shave off absolutely every excess bit of weight, just kind of get it down to it's the basics. So you're still running, but there's no excess there. They're shaving it bit by bit. They're working out well, how I'm they like can make a, a human as A brain and a jaw. Yeah. So you're saying that in a factory, not a factory, but in some kind of secret location, there's my <laughs> there's a room that has my appendix, my tonsils, my full skin. Yeah. They might just be trying to remake you in a different room, just yeah. sneak you out bit by bit. 20 years it's time, a way I'm going like to walk past a bloke and be like, he looks familiar. <laughs> <laughs> As I wield a jar and a brain and eyes, I'm like... I can't, just the eyes kind of look up at the person pushing me. They're like, is everything all right? I kind of look over at, look over at this person. <laughs> I'm like, I think that's me. It's a bloke with no eyes. Just. Oh man. Look, we've done loads. We've done ages. We've done ages. How, how long have we done? Uh, we've done like, I think we started about five minutes late. So about an hour and 20. So an hour 21, maybe we can push on. We can push through. You know, we've covered most of the the questions I had for you. <laughs> I kind of felt I was like in, there was uh, I was in um, Harry Hill brought back stars in their eyes. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, I remember. You were like his, I, his I was in, Yeah, I was in every episode of that. Yeah. That went out in January, right? Yeah. And that was my first TV appearance. I don't know what the hell that thing was you mentioned earlier, but that that was my first thing. On Christmas time of that year, 2015, I got a text going, I've just seen you on TV. I'm like, oh, really? What uh, What am I in? I was on um, It Will Be All Right on the night. <laughs> I don't think anyone has, from their debut, to being on it will be all right on the night, done it as quick as I did. You, what you want me to be, you want me impressed by you fuck something up and so you got on, you'll be all right in the night. I just think from, <laughs> from debut. Yeah. What in 10 months? In 10 months. 11, to have yeah. Dennis Norden going, look at this chap. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember what I've done. I'm glad I was on it when he was doing it, though. I don't know. Does someone yeah. do it now? Probably. I think probably Harry Hill. Does. Harry Hill seems to have taken over most of those jobs. Who is it who does all right on the night? Is it Walliams? Yeah, it might be, actually. I think it might. And it's just yeah. voiceover now. He's not. He doesn't have the clipboard or anything. No, you've got to have the clipboard, haven't you? You've got to have the clipboard sit there. The thing with Dennis Norden, as you know, I'm yeah. sure, is how incredible a comedy writer he was. Of course, yeah. But growing up, as I did, he was just the bloke who took the piss out of people. And then as you get older, you're like, Christ, this guy was like, you know, he was one of the best comic minds of, of the 50s. Yeah. And, 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 and 60s business. and stuff. I mean, he's lucky that he managed to have a career that went, you know, then he became a TV celebrity. You forget everything that's happened. No one's going to remember guessable <laughs> by the end of by the end of 2020 
The thing like now, but also like now, if you do a TV show, there's so many TV shows, it's so hard to even break through and be that one that people actually watch, you know, that people have heard of. So you can you can even do like two or three series or something and like nobody, you know, if you went out in the street and said, hey, have you watched this? They go, most things. When you think about how much drama, because of all the because of all the channels and all the different streaming services, like uh, Apple TV. Who watches Apple TV? I oh, know. That's mad. Nobody. And like all those things are on Apple TV. We go, this is really good. You go, yeah, I've got Apple TV. God, I've never watched it. Never watched it. But I want to be on Apple TV. You want to be or you don't want to be? They're get No, they, the, the thing about TV... No one gives a fuck if anyone watches it when they're making it. Right. Because you, you, you're getting paid. You, yeah. You're like, you do what you want. I've done my job. I'm out of it. Wouldn't it be nice? But, you know, I would. I, I think when I started in TV, there was the potential that you could do a show and people would watch it and it would people would talk about it and, and people would like it and it might lead to something. And now I feel even if I wrote something that got onto TV, Right, so I've written loads of things that haven't got on TV. <laughs> but even if you got made and you did a series, there's still every chance people go, "Yeah, if you went down the street, if you watch this, watch this thing." No. But your radio show that's being groomed for TV, right? What? Which one? Relativity? Yeah. I don't think so, really. I mean, they would, they occasionally they kind of come to me and say, "Would you do it like it?" So they asked me if I'd do it as a an audience sitcom kind of thing, and I, I sort of went, I thought about it and thought, I don't. Really, it's not really what it is, but that's so. That's what they want. Yeah, if you get that right, that's the holy grail, I think. A, a, a. Well, and there are people who do. There are people, you know, there are some people doing great sitcoms that do work for a mass audience. But I just don't think that's what that sitcom is. It's like a sitcom about, you know, it's about observations about family life, but it's not. Let's stick it in front of an audience and see if they laugh at this. You know, there's some jokes in it, but there aren't. It's not like it's like jokes that people are laugh at in the in the situation comedy, not in an audience. You know what I mean? It's not like building up to laughs and building up to situations. Exactly, it might work, but I don't know. I I I just it's too. I just don't think it's so much work. Even like with that, that now is written, and it would be reasonably easy to turn that into a TV show. Still feels like too much work. Every episode, I'm quite, I'm quite happy doing it on the radio. I'm quite happy doing it on the radio. Every episode of Forty Towers, yeah, was filmed in two hours. Right. That explains a lot yeah. about its energy. You know, well, I think it was six months an ep- six months an episode to write. Yeah, they took a long time on each episode, and then they filmed it all each episode in two hours because. Yeah. That was literally what the studio gave them. It was like what you have to do in two hours. And I think when you learn that, you think the energy of that show, the farce of it, obviously fed through the pace of uh, how how little time they had to do it. Just imagine two hours to put, you know. Also, with audience members, two hours is like, that's like a play. They're not bored at all. They just go, yeah, great. That was mad. What's gonna, <laughs> you know, what what's gonna? How's this gonna come out in the edit? <laughs> Which is never a, mind. The bus box was a three-hour record. So, that's you know, what that, I mean. There we go. It, that's that what I'm saying. That's what that I'm saying. Some kind of context. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, well, you know, there's good and bad things. I think, you know, I, I think there's, I think, like, I, I think the, the British model of, well, I heard you talking to Stuart Goldsmith about this today about how, you know, in in the UK, like comedians sort of feel like they've got to do everything themselves or it doesn't count. But if you go to America, everyone's working together. And if you see American sitcoms, they're put together by collaboration of people, <laughs> and so therefore can do twenty two episodes. Though I've managed to do that more or less on my own with one, the only series I've got on TV, I did manage to almost write twenty-two episodes on my own. But you know, it's it's 
it, it's that different approach, isn't it? In the, um, I think Ameri- I just feel Americans are more, you know, I think a lot of the big movie star Americans who you think of all came from a sketch improv background. Your Will Ferrells, uh, all the Saturday Night Live stuff, um, Amy Poehler and Tina Fey. They all come from improv and sketch and working together. I was reading something actually today about British sitcoms and American sitcoms, which I don't know if I, I just read it today, so I don't know if I agree with it, but they said in American sitcoms, you want to hang out with them. So you want to go to Cheers and you want to sit and have a beer with all of those characters. And in British sitcoms, you like looking down at them and how they're struggling. Yeah, might be. I, d- I, I guess there's no broad, you know. I, there's there's a rule. There's. I'm aware that you could point out things and go, well, what about that? But I do think the best British sitcoms. You are looking on, and American sitcoms they really do build it on. You want to hang out. Sure. You know, they could almost have filmed an episode of Forty Towers in the amount of time we've been talking. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, I bet, occasionally they came in at ninety minutes. We've been going for yeah, nearly ninety minutes. You know, it's nice. It's I, people don't have to. People can stop listening as long as they've got through the bit with the whiskey advert in. That's fine. <laughs> this is where the numbers slowly creep up. We're doing all right in terms. Of, I can tell you the people watching it live. It's it's stayed pretty consistent. That might be new people coming in, saying, "Watch this," and they're ah, oh. but pretty consistent. Well done, John Cairns. People love you. The people out there love you. You're an extremely fine uh, stand-up comedian, and uh, your last show was all about knocking around in a flat on your own, wasn't it? Basically, the last stand-up show you did, more or less, which is. You know, must now be grimly ironic. <laughs> <laughs> it pretty, I mean, it, I I mean, it what... was pretty much. Yeah. It's kind of what uh, it was pretty mad, actually. But that's a, so you would like to do that as a sitcom, presumably. Would you like to do a sitcom version of John Ken's the stand up guy in a flat? Um, well, the. Uh... <laughs> I'd be lying if I said I hadn't pitched that, but, you know, the problem is, it's then, well, what's it about? It's like, oh, I don't really know. It doesn't really do much. It's like, well, sounds great. Not. I think, well, I think you know, if you I... think of, like, like Jacques Tati, right, he's an he's a, like a, he's one, like, he walks around and you don't know anything about him. You don't know where he lives. If he's got family, you don't know if he's like an alien who's just landed. And it doesn't matter because the 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 situations are funny and he is the although he is quite out of worldy, he's also very real in that we are him in the situation. And through his uh ignorance and uh you know it makes the normal life look abstract when you follow him. So I, that is what I like, and that's what I try and do in my stand-up. I mean, when it comes to writing sitcoms, I think maybe it's something I'd like to do, and it's something that I might take a different tact on completely and try and, you know, you look at, you know, you read Galton and Simpson scripts, and you think, oh, I wonder who inspired them, and it's like people like N.F. Simpson, who was this playwright, and they read Chekhov and Ibsen and you're like, fucking hell, you know, the, the Steptoe's son is rooted in, in that stuff. So I don't know when I'm writing stand up, I, I think maybe you have to put on a different hat when, you know, when you read about Gordon and Simpson, they go, the comedy, we worried about that. We didn't write comedies. We wrote dramas. The comedy came from the characters, not the situations. So and that's different with stand up. So uh, I do, I do over the years, I have thought it's not as easy as just putting what I do on stage in a, in a script. Not necessarily, but 
But you know, I think what's it, you you are obviously someone who thinks uh, and reads a lot and has a lot of um, references to draw on. A lot of uh, you know all the stuff we just talked about in this. It just shows how uh, educated you are, and that isn't what TV wants. So that's that's the thing. You know, they don't. They, if Golden Simpsons came along now, I don't. I think they'd find it very hard to get any of that stuff on because people go, no, we don't we want something simple. It's something that people will understand. But the thing is, you know, I did a very high concept sitcom was my last sitcom, and they still said, what's it about? And so, like, you go, well, it's about this. They go, no, it should, it should be about this. And you go, well, this is what it's about. <laughs> and it was, you know, it was, they, they want to know, you know, they want to be able to define stuff so they can uh, compare it to something else, and but without realising that everything that's successful is the thing that breaks the rules and, you know, the things that make them in the end, make them the big money and make them the big viewers is get them the big viewers is is the original ideas rather than the stuff that's copied off other well, people. Well, like you know, Hancock. You know, does Magna Carta mean nothing to you? Did she die in vain? Uh, you know, just you know, I mean, perfect. <laughs> and yet, you could just imagine referencing Magna Carta. You you get the feeling a producer or an exec would go, who was she? <laughs> did she lie in vain? I did. I had to walk. I, I every day I walked past a real Magna Carta for four years when I worked in Parliament. Yeah, and I'd have to tell kids yeah. what it was. They couldn't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> this means that you could get a fair trial if you do anything wrong, right? All right, let's move on. Habeas corpus. Habeas corpus. <laughs> Habeas corpus. <laughs> Saying that just over and over to five-year-olds. What the fuck is he on about? <laughs> well, John, we're gonna go. We're gonna. We're gonna. I think you know. We've got to leave it there on the, on and up. We've hit a height. I, uh, I've had a lot of fun. I which- I've I've really really love talking to you. I think you uh, are. Um, look, it doesn't matter about look, TV's a dead medium. You can get all this. You can do what you need to do online. You don't need anyone else. I'll give you some money. We can do it. Um, so uh, <laughs> I'll sell this jumper, and I'll give you the money. <laughs> you can be the, you can be the charity, and you can make what you want to make. <laughs> It'll be fine. I'm. I'm, um, I'm, I'm... Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. No, no, man. It's always lovely to talk to you. I like it when, uh, you know, this it's fun, man. It's fun. This these are these are, you know, it's no one else is like you. I really love talking to you, and uh, it's really good fun just being rude to each other, but also cracking on with stupid ideas and seeing what happens, and then getting a little bit uh, serious at the end. And yeah, it did get nice. serious. Got good though. Then it's fine. It's all right. That's what this podcast is all about. And like the people don't, it does to you people at home. When it gets to the point that you've had enough, you listen to something else. Drunk women solving crimes. Good. Um, so, um, <laughs> uh, the Taskmaster has a podcast out. That'd be interesting. I'm on Taskmaster, John. It starts uh, tomorrow, nine o'clock. For those people who are watching this live, Tomorrow I'm doing, I've got Ali and Herring's Twitch of Fun and there's a new character and you. I literally can't believe what it is. It's been delivered to me unsolicited in the post <laughs> and it is, uh, um, you were literally going to shit, you're going to be like John Ken dad when you see this. <laughs> you're going to shit your pants at what has been delivered to me. I can't do it justice is what I'm saying, but it's going to be in tomorrow's show, 7.30, 9 o'clock. I'm going to do a watch along with Taskmaster, which I'll be doing every week, I think, if it works out okay. So if you're listening to this or watching this uh, when it goes out, join in on Thursday nights at 9, 7.30 for Ali and Herring's Twitch. You're fun, twitch.tv slash RK Herring. You can link your Amazon Prime account and give us money for nothing. It doesn't cost you a thing. If you can be asked to come back every month and do that. It's where it's all at, John. Come on uh, Twitch and do your stuff and people can give you money for, for free. No, I... It'll work. It'll all work I do you. a podcast. Yeah. What's the podcast? It's called Microscope. Okay. <laughs> With Matt Ewins. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, yes, that's right. It's, uh, it's hit and miss, but the uh, <laughs> when we hit, it's good. 
So everyone listen to that. Listen to Microscope. Andy McH says, at last, it's brilliant. Um, and come on Twitch, John. I'm telling you, it's your medium. Is it? I You're mean, I don't person. know. I'm looking at I this think thing. So. Like, I think I out, of all the, out of all the people that I think um, really need to, and I think I think more comedians need to do it, but it suits long-form weird stuff, for sure, and improvised stuff, and mm. uh, it's good. It's good, man, and you can get some of Ian Amazon's money for free if you can get people to give it to you. Um, and then you can make that make more stuff with it. We'll talk, we'll chat. We'll chat. Let's have a chat. We'll chat. Let's, this isn't a chat. We'll chat. <laughs> this, was, we'll chat. this wasn't the chat. <laughs> we'll chat. We'll chat. This wasn't the chat. This was just the uh, prelude. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm back next week. Oh well, so next week is John Robbins, which you can still probably get somewhere online. I'll put some links up for you if you want to pay and give some money to Refuge. It'd be lovely if you did that. There'll be bonus content on that. And that will be out next week. Uh, then coming up is uh, Ed Gamble and Nels Cavell. And I'm doing some live gigs at the Alley Pally on the 12th of November. COVID allowing. COVID-19. I'm waiting for COVID-20. I reckon that's going to be the uh, going to be the real it's going to be the real humdinger. That's what I'm looking forward to. Um, so thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Give a massive round of applause to the wonderful John Cairns. And watch uh, Guessable. Is that what it's called? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thanks for watching, kids. See you next time. <laughs>